So um, the title of this talk is Non-Commutative Worlds and Discrete Physics. And I'm going to begin by uh, talking about discrete, phys discrete systems a little bit, and then we will go forward towards the physics. The motivation for this talk comes from uh, the Feynman-Dyson derivation from a long time ago, must be around 1990 that Dyson published this paper, um, in which he gets Maxwell's equations from commutators. So the setup, the way it was done by Dyson, uh, was that you define, you have three non-commuting operators, x1, x2, and x3. Um, uh, that is to say, they commute with one another, but there is the time derivative of the xi's, and those delta ij each other, the xi delta ij's with the xi, xj dot. So it looks like position and momentum in a way. Um, and you define H, the analog of the electromagnetic field, to be, of the B field, to be the cross product of X dot with itself. Now, since this is a non commutative situation, and I did not say that the X dot, Xi dots commuted with one another, this is the formal vector cross product where you keep track of the non commutativity. So in a vector cross, cross product where you have x1, x2 minus x2, x1, uh, that, uh, that would be non-zero in this situation. And you, def you, um, you define E in their derivation by x double dot is equal to E plus x dot cross H. And then you find uh, with these stipulations that E and H satisfy Maxwell's equations in the sense that I've written here. Um, and uh, what has to be understood is that derivatives are given by commutators uh, in order to work with this world at all. And uh, I will explain what I mean by derivatives are given by commutators as I go along because we will be generalizing the situation. Um, and we will generalize this derivation. Uh, I got interested in this a long time ago uh, through working with Pierre Noyes, uh, and I'm still thinking about it. And uh, one question that we had long ago was whether there would be an interpretation of this in terms of discrete physics, but we'll see. And we won't get back to this for a few minutes. Questions on what I've said so far? Okay, so, oh. well, is that feedback indicating someone had a question and they opened their mic? There was an echoing feedback. Oh, now I would like an indication to know that you are hearing me, just to make sure everything is going along. He hearing you loud and clear. Okay. I see. When somebody opens their mic, sometimes you get a, a very yeah. nice feedback. Echo. Um, Sydney, is it possible for you to use headphones, maybe? I think that's why it's echoing back. So I want to think about fundamentals of uh, recursion for a little while in discrete systems. Uh, and you'll see where I go with this as I go. Um, but this slide indicates uh, something fundamental and very simple. Um, on the top of the slide, I have a re-entering box. And then I've written the formalism of that, L is equal to box around L. And this is the compacted re-entry or recursive de description of a system that could uh, evolve in time. And if it evolves in time, then this has to be written as the next L is equal to box around the previous L in which case you would have a temporal evolution of it in the form of the right arrow situation at the bottom of the slide. First there's a box, first there's nothing, then there's a box, then there's a box around it. Yes, question? Turn the mic off. Question? The mic is off. Okay. There's a box around it, then a box around that, then a box around that, and so on. This is, L 
n plus 1 is equal to box around ln. And we have a discrete system evolving in time according to a recursive rule. On the other hand, uh, if I wanted a solution to L equals box around L, I could take an infinite nest of boxes, which is what's indicated on the left, even though there are only a finite number of boxes in, the, in that nest. And then if you put one more box around the infinite nest, it wouldn't change it. And so you would actually have a solution to the compacted reentry equation. And as you see, the temporal evolution of the system is trending toward a uh, fixed point, in this case, uh, if you interpreted it the right way. Um, also, um, the system might be oscillatory. There's no reason why it should be continually building up. Depends on the properties of the operator. And there are other things to say about recursions, but I'll stop there and just leave this as, a, as an icon for the idea of a recursion. And as I say, I want to think about certain simple examples that occur first, and then we will talk more generally. So a simple example that I like in relation to this is the square root of minus one. Uh, if you think of the square root of minus one as being defined in terms of itself, that is I squared equals minus one, but you could think of it as being defined in terms of itself, I is equal to minus one over I, and then, it is in the form of a reentry. Uh, it is not a re it is not an oscillation or a recursion or anything else. It's just in the form of that reentry of i into its own indicational space. And the formal solution to it would look like minus one over minus one over minus one over forever. And then formally that would be a solution, but it wouldn't be a number. Um, and of course the question from long ago is what kind of a number would this be if you were to take it on as a number and and it wasn't really until around 1800 that people came to the present well-known geometric interpretation of this but we're going to look at it uh in the form of a recursive system in which case the next one is minus one over the previous one and if you fed that system a plus one, it would give you a minus one. And if you fed it a minus one, it would give you a plus one. And so this is a very elementary, discrete, dynamical system, which just oscillates between plus one and minus one. And depending on how you started it, or depending on where in the temporality of it you looked, you would see it as going from minus one to plus one, or from plus one to minus one. Uh, and taking that seriously, uh, there are two views of, of the discrete system that we're looking at. One is a pair minus one plus one, and the other one a pair plus one minus one. And so that comes out of thinking of it this way. And I would like to turn the pair or the notion of the oscillation itself into the number. I want to um structure the oscillation or structure the pair in such a way that its square is minus one so this slide is saying what i just said that i'm looking at the oscillation between plus one and minus one there are naturally two viewpoints which i why well, denote by plus minus or minus plus and they correspond to starting with plus or minus and uh i want I, I won't really use this notation, but it's the concept. I want the iterant for plus minus to stand for the undisclosed alternation or ambiguity between plus one and minus one. And there are two views of it, one articulated as starting with plus and the other articulated as starting as minus. Um, and given a pair, A, B, I can think of B, A as the same process with a shift of one time step. So in this case, I have a very elementary process, and I have the idea of shifting that process by one time step. And these two views will become square roots of minus one i and minus i, as we'll see in a moment. And how are we going to do that? Well, one way to do that is the following, that I introduce uh, a temporal shift operator, eta. And a b multiplied by eta is the same as eta 
multiplied by BA, so that when you push eta across the AB, it becomes the BA, and eta squared will be equal to 1. So, so then I can think algebraically about what will happen if I multiply entities like this together. I'll multiply bare entities, thinking of them as discrete waveforms, by multiplying them term by term. So in that case, if you multiply the sequence plus minus plus minus plus minus by itself, it would give you plus minus plus 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 all the way along. It would square to plus one because you would be taking corresponding terms and multiplying them. So that doesn't square to minus one, it squares to plus one. But on the other hand, if you have the eta in place, then what you have is a representation of the idea of something oscillating. And when you let them interact with one another, you even let it interact with itself, it takes a little time step in order to interact. And because it takes a little time step in order to interact, it is shifted between 1 minus 1 in one of them and minus 1, 1 in the other. And then when they interact, they give you minus in both cases, and you get minus 1. Algebraically, that's indicated on the bottom of the slide. Here's the 1 minus 1 eta interacting with the 1 minus 1 eta. But when it does, the only way it can is for the eta to shift over to the right, let's say, and get out of the way. Uh, and that causes the uh, entity to time shift. And then they interact with one another. The eta's go away and you get minus one. So the one minus one eta is a formalization of that idea that I have this vibrating entity, a temporal entity, and it interacts with itself, but it requires a little time step in order to do so. And that causes I squared to become minus one. Because if you think of it as a vibrating entity, when it's one at one time, in the very next time it's minus one. And so you're always interacting one with minus one. The eta can be thought of as a kind of very special synchronization, if you think of it temporally, or as a non commuting algebraic operator, if you think of it algebraically. So that time and non commutation are closely related to one another here. I seem to have repeated myself in this slide and said what I just said, that I is now temporally sensitive, so a time shift occurs when it interacts with itself. Uh, and this slide is not necessary. Um, so you could make it into a principle and then see whether this principle applies to things. So I call this principle of temporal nexus. So take as a matter of principle that the usual real variable t for time is better represented or can be represented as i t so that time is seen to be a process, an observation, and a magnitude all at once. And of course, uh, this philosophically is related to wick rotation between time as real and time as imaginary. For example, when you put the i t into uh, the usual metric, uh, on four dimensions, you get the space-time metric because i squared is minus one. But we'll come back to that. What have we done? Um, we've made an algebra out of simple dynamical systems that are of period two. Um, but in fact, we've uh, stumbled or walked into two by two matrix algebra. That's what we've actually produced here. Uh, and how do you see that? Well, let's look at this slide, and it will become quite clear what happened. Uh, if you take at the bottom a two-by-two two matrix, A, B, C, D, you see that you can think of it as a diagonal matrix times the identity and another diagonal matrix, B, C, times the permutation matrix, P. P is the notation in this slide, 0, 1, 1, 0. And P has exact, if you think that bracket AB is the diagonal matrix AB, then you see that the diagonal matrix times the permutation matrix is the same as the permutation matrix times the flip of the diagonal matrix. So the algebra that we 
produce relatively naturally thinking about the discrete dynamics of this period two system is really giving us two by two matrix algebra. Uh, and here the I is the anti-diagonal matrix minus one one, which is in fact a well-known representation of I. Uh, so we get two by two matrix algebra in another way. There are many ways to get matrix algebra out of out of articulating some situation, and this is another one. Um, but it shows you that this is really quite um, a um, a natural way to think about what the square root of minus one means. That is, when you look at the two by two matrix, which represents the square root of minus one with its anti-diagonal minus one, one, you can think of that as an oscillation between minus one and one, and that the fit is perfect between those interpretations. You can also think of it as a 90 degree rotation, and the fit is perfect between them. So uh, I've been playing with this for a long time, trying to see whether I can talk to my talk myself into thinking of the eyes that occur in various situations as oscillations. And sometimes that's interesting, and sometimes it's confusing. What do you do for higher order matrices? Well, uh, you have higher order permutations. So, uh, so I'm going to write an n-tuple in general and a permutation to the right of it. And you can think of that if you wish to think of matrix algebra as a diagonal matrix x1 through xn multiplied by a permutation matrix. And then you will have the same kind of situation. You will have the x times a matrix times a permutation times y times a permutation will be x y permuted by sigma, sigma gets past it and permutes it, times the product of the permutations. And you have a kind of group algebra in back of matrix algebra of that kind that generalizes all of that and is often very interesting to look at. For example, um, here are Hamilton's quaternions represented in that way on permutations of four things, where the iterant is now uh, order four instead of order two, uh, and we have certain permutations. Uh, so these are the elements of the dynamics. You would interchange one and two and three and four, or one and three and two and four, or one and four and two and three. Um, and, uh, and you have these oscillations, if you like, which are going between one and minus one. And uh, those will give you the quaternions if you multiply according to the method that I just told you. These are signed permutation representations of the quaternions that you're looking at. But as I say, you can also think of them as certain kinds of oscillations with interesting temporalities associated with them. And of course, you can simplify for quaternions by allowing uh, that the iterants themselves have complex numbers in them. Uh, and then uh, life goes back to two by two matrices. And in fact, I particularly like the following one at the bottom of the slide. You can ignore the rest. I have two entities which anti-commute, E and eta, little Clifford algebra, E and eta equals minus eta and E, and E squared equals one and eta squared equals one. This is what we had before to create I, but in fact, we, we have a little Clifford algebra there generated by one and E and eta and E eta. E eta is the I, just as before. Um, uh, and, uh, and then if you want the quaternions from that, that little algebra is sometimes called the split quaternions. It's almost the quaternions. If you want the quaternions from that, why well, you just multiply some of them by a commuting square root of minus one, iota there at the bottom of the slide. So you take iota e, e eta for j, and iota eta for k, and that will work if you multiply it out. For example, i times j is i e e eta, but e squared is one, so you get i eta. Or j times k is e eta iota eta, um, and um, 
on there. And I'm not happy with that. There's probably a misprint in the way I wrote it. Let's see. Did it come out wrong? Looks like it came out wrong. E eta times I eta is I commutes with everybody is just um is just I E. No, it's fine. Okay, right. Uh, we did that slowly enough for doing it in our heads, right? E eta times eta is just E. So you get I E, and we're back to I. So the, it'll go round and do the quaternions for you nicely that way. Okay. Uh, uh, you don't need to go calculating, but there it is. Um, but you know, the quaternions aren't just an iterant system. Uh, it's my um, it's my desire to think of them uh, iteratively like that, uh, to think of, of discrete processes behind each quaternion. But, uh, but they're also highly geometric, and uh, there's, a, there's a complementary way of thinking about them that is like the, uh, uh, like the interpretation of the quaternions in the comp as comp uh, of the complex numbers as rotations, only now uh, you think of each quaternion as represented by a 180 degree rotation around an axis in three dimensional space. Maybe you've thought about this and maybe you haven't, uh, but uh, it works really perfectly. Um, and uh, I've illustrated it here with this cartoon. In the cartoon, we have um, a little sphere which is hanging down from, uh, from a bar and uh, each of the quaternions, I, J, and K, is represented by a rotation around a different axis. So, um, uh, so then uh, if you were, um, if we were all in the room together, but I can ask you to do it anyway, um, I'm not going to go resharing my screen, but if you hold your arm out, palm up, right hand, and you turn it by 180 degrees counterclockwise, you can take that to be I. And if you have your hand out down now, and you t turn it by 180 degrees around the vertical axis so that your hand now points toward you, you can call that J. And if you have your hand out again, and you turn by 180 degrees around the axis from the right to the left across your body, that would be K. And so when you do that, hand out, turn by 180 degrees around the axis out, going out from your body, then turn by 180 degrees around the vertical axis, you see that you get the same result as 180 degrees um, uh, directly toward your body, so that IJ equals K, and you've represented the quaternions by 180 degree rotations of a hand which is connected to a body, uh, or of uh, a little sphere circle which is connected by a belt to a wall and the thing that makes all this work is the fact that if you rotate uh it around by 360 degrees you will get a 360 degree rotation on the belt which is non-trivial but if you rotate it by one more 360 degree turn you get something which is topologically equal to nothing, right back to the original belt, the belt trick. And that belt trick tells you that the 360 degree turn can be regarded as minus one. So I squared is minus one. And if you did I squared in the description that I gave you, your palm is out and you turn by 180 degrees, and you turn by 180 degrees again, your hand is twisted by 360 degrees. Well, in the absence of being able to um, show you that uh, directly, although you may have tried the experiment that I just described to you, here's a film we made a long time ago. Two minutes. I think I will turn the sound. Oh, I can't. Sounds not great. I'll be quiet.
So, so there's a lot going on there um, between, on the one hand, that you can think of these algebras like the quaternions as arising uh, out of, out of reentry, and then discrete dynamics, very simple discrete dynamics, and then, uh, and then, extending that kind of dynamics to a more uh, dimensions or adding a commuting square root of minus one, different ways in which the algebras naturally kind of evolve out of each other. Uh, and, and at the same time, paralleling that, there is the geometric interpretation of the complex numbers as rotations and the deeper uh, geometric interpretation of the quaternions as uh, unitary transformations and rotations of three-dimensional space. Um, and and then the interrelationships with topology as well. All of this, um, all of this happening all together at once in a certain way. Uh, and the question is, how is the recursive or iterant or or discrete dynamical way of thinking about this related with the geometry? And um, I think we don't fully understand that. And maybe someone would be interested in that question like i'm interested in that question and another person might not be interested in that question it depends on in what direction you're going um but it's in, i think it's important to understand that all of that is coming out happening at once in the development of in the way algebras uh um kind of develop naturally out of considerations of distinctions that one makes and recursions that happen. Uh, and I want to go farther than this here. Um, we've reformulated the complex numbers and expanded it to matrix algebras and so on. But, uh, but I started by talking about very simple discrete systems. And I want to just consider an arbitrary discrete system now. So it's going to be a bit more abstract. I have an arbitrary discrete system. Uh, I have a time variable. Um, and then I have increments of time, delta t, two delta t, three delta t, and I have velocity uh, as uh, as a discrete derivative. Uh, is there a question coming up? Yeah, but yeah we, we can't see the change of the screen because it's frozen. Uh, can you, you saw, the, did you see the movie? Yeah, we yeah, saw the movie. Yeah, after this, it's, it's frozen. Unless but after the movie, it's frozen. You don't see the next screen. That's right. No, we didn't see that. That's strange. We, we, I, do, we do see it. It might be an issue on your okay. end. It's, um, I'm confused. What do you see now? We have just reformulated the complex numbers and expanded the complex. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. okay. Why do you think it's frozen? I thought you had changed the screen because your your visual of your face had frozen. So I thought that maybe the, yeah. the pictures on the oh, side oh, keep freezing for some I reason. Do, I, do I not think see the visual of my face. Yeah. Okay. okay. Not okay. The okay. My, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. You don't need my face, right? Okay. You don't need mine either. So I think I'm going to reduce bandwidth and get rid of that. Perhaps okay. We can do that too. Yeah. So uh, we're all, we're talking about this slide, which is saying I can. I can consider velocity discreetly, right? Of course I can, right? And I'll call it d of x of t is x dx of t plus delta t minus x of t divided by delta t, yeah? Uh, but uh, what are we going to do with that? Well, here's what I'm going to do with it, all right? Now I change the notation. Sorry, these slides flip back and forth between some different notations. You can get used to them slide by slide. Now I have the delta t is equal to 1, OK? So all I have are positions. It's very abstract. Uh, all I need is to be able to compare two positions, and I call that subtraction, all right? Maybe it's your usual subtraction. Uh, so the velocity is the difference between x at one time forward minus x at a given time. So, of course, the velocity at a later time might be x triple minus x double. Okay. And then uh, I want to think of measurement. Uh, and this is not quantum measurement. It's just measurement in a discrete world. So that means I could measure the x or I could measure the velocity. 
But you'll notice that measuring velocity requires two times. There's no question about it. Uh, and so if there's a clock ticking, the clock will have to tick uh, in order to measure the velocity. The clock, in principle, does not have to tick to measure the position. So I will take that to be the simplest model I can imagine for this. When I have a, a variable x, I do not use the time. But when I'm measuring a variable v, then I have to allow two times and I let the clock tick. Time is going forward. So that means that if I measure x and then I measure v, and the measurements go from right to left, like function composition. So if I measure x and then I measure v, as on the bottom of the slide, I get the product x prime minus x multiplied by x. But if I measure v first and then I measure x, as is illustrated in the third line from the, the second line from the bottom, then I get x prime minus x, but the, then when I measure x, it's x prime. So x is the abstract notion of measuring x on the left, but it's, it's, um, its actual measurement on the right indicated is x prime because time went forward by one step. So vx and xv don't uh, give you the same result. Position and velocity do not commute. And you can look at the difference between them. You can look at the difference between xv and vx. And as you see, assuming that the x's and the x primes all commute with one another, you get x prime minus x squared. You get the distance change squared. So you see we're getting a commutator calculus related to discrete measurement. And this is coming from the fact that measurement depends on order. Now, I want to make an algebraic image of this. And so I introduce a time shifting operator, just as I did in the simple discrete system that we had before, at least an analogy to it, there's a slight formal difference, but J here, when you push it to the uh, across an X, takes you to J times X at the next time. So that's introducing a non-commuting operator that represents time evolution. You, now, it's no longer we're going to be assumed that j squared is 1, because time is going on. Um, but we could assume that j is invertible, thinking algebraically. And then it would say j inverse xj is equal to x prime. x prime is resulting from conjugating x by j. So we have a non-commutative algebra which represents time evolution. And now let's see what will happen if we define the velocity to be j times x prime minus x. Now what happens is that if somebody, um, if, if velocity is performed and written out, the time shifting nature of the velocity is still there in the operator j. So I don't, as I did in the previous slide, have to look and remember that the time shifted when I went to the right, to the left of a V. If I did a V first, then the time should shift for the X. I don't have to remember it anymore. It's part of the algebra. And I've indicated it here with a little calculation. We have XV minus VX. You have XJ times X prime minus X, minus J times X prime minus X times X. But the J, in the first part, goes to the left and turns the x into x prime. So that's just exactly saying that the presence of a velocity on the right causes time to evolve on the left of it. And now you have j factored off to the left, and you collect terms, and you get just what we had before. So now we have that the commutator of x and v is j times x prime minus x squared. Um, and we can work algebraically with this and see what we get. So we can do discrete calculus um, in a measurement framework in this way by defining the derivative to be a time-shifting operator times the discrete difference. I'm going to be repeating myself on this if you find this a little hard to remember. 
So here I'm repeating it again in the calculus form. I would have x of t times j is j times x at t plus 1. And I would redefine my full discrete derivative to be j multiplied by the ordinary discrete derivative. Now, it's amusing to see what happened here. Pardon me for uh, uh, shifting my notations too many times. dt just meant delta t. I have j times x at t plus dt minus j times x at t. That's what happens in my difference quotient at the top, right? But j times x at t plus dt is x of t times j. So you see, that difference now is the commutator of x of t with j. So the difference quotient has been represented by taking a commutator and the, by represented by taking a commutator. And so the derivative that I have defined, the d with the j in it, is actually taking a commutator with x. And taking the commutator of something with a constant uh, element satisfies the Leibniz rule. Leibniz rule that the derivative of a product is the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Leibniz rule is the footprint of ordinary calculus, and you use it nearly unconsciously all the time whenever you do any calcula calculus at all. And if you are trying to do discrete calculus, you have to learn not to use it. Uh, and keep track of certain compensations. But in this adjusted discrete calculus, you have the Leibniz rule. And furthermore, all the derivatives are represented by commutators. Now, you'll recall that I said that one of the features of the original Feynman-Dyson derivation was that all the derivatives were going to be represented by commutators. Here in the discrete, in this formulation of it, it's natural. That's what we do. We're going to represent derivatives by commutators for these reasons. Now, uh, I've repeated myself here, um, so I don't have to read this slide, but you will notice that I now divided by delta t. So I get that the commutator of x with dx, where dx is my new velocity, is given by the j times delta x squared over delta t. The, dis the, time, the distance step divided by the time step. So that's my basic commutator of position and velocity. Position and velocity commutator is this time operator, uh, which you can ignore if you're just thinking of the numerical values, times the step squared divided by the time step. Um, and if you were to set that equal to a constant, commutator of position and velocity equal to a constant, a kind of Heisenberg commutator, uh, then you see that that constant could be regarded as a diffusion constant because in a Brownian process, the diffusion constant is a, time, a distance squared divided by a time uh, difference. And that leads to the diffusion equation. So, we could explore that direction, but I'm not going to in this slideshow. Um, and the simplest situation is indeed uh, having delta x be a plus or minus some step. Uh, that will satisfy a constant commutator in exactly this way. So a Brownian process is an example of something that is described by this. What about Heisenberg's commutator? Well, we, we start with this commutator, x dx is j times delta x squared over delta t. And I will simplify it by erasing the j so that and putting in a q and a p. So the, the velocity is now replaced by p over m, and the q is replaced by is replacing x. So it it's the usual formalism. And we'll put the j in the background, and then it looks like Q, P over M is delta X squared over delta T. And then I will um, make a philosophical move and say that delta T should be replaced by the nexus, I delta T. And that delta X squared over delta T could be the simple thing that happens 
in terms of units, has the same units as h bar over m. And then you would have q p over m is equal to minus i h bar over m. And that's the same as pq equals i h bar. So you can walk over to the Heisenberg commutator by making those changes. But those changes, in fact, are the way you go between quantum mechanics and discrete uh, or diffusion equation physics, where you put the I in where it wasn't before. Uh, and, uh, and the philosophical move of replacing time by I time uh, needs to be thought of, thought about more carefully. Uh, so this is a formal jump, which uh, tells a story that you might want to think about. Now let's go back. Um, I'm repeating myself again. This says nothing more than I said before, except that I use x dot here, uh, and I haven't turned it into the j yet. So this is just repeating. We'll um, we'll skip it. But I put in the j, and I have an x dot now, and the x dot once it is j times x prime minus x over delta t is a commutator. But now I want to generalize the situation. So, so I'm going to just put myself in some uh, big situation where I have an algebra of commutators. Could be large matrices, or it could be an abstract algebra where I have commutators. I could generalize this further and just have a Lie product, but let's stay with commutators because it's easy to write them. So, uh, so then if I have uh, a certain element in this big algebraic background, then I can talk about the derivative in that element's direction, delta n, as the commutator of f with n. And that satisfies the Leibniz rule as you can compute. So all my derivatives are of that form. And I think I want to think about the structure of worlds that are based on non-commutative algebra. And I want to build everything from the ground up this way, mathematically, at least. So we have the Jacobi identity around, and you often use it. Um, now, in particular, um, I define in this algebraic context the curvature of a derivative in the ni direction to be the commutator of the directional uh, operators for the, do, the two derivatives. That is, you can calculate that the commutator of the operations, delta i and delta j, delta i of delta j of f minus delta j of delta i of f, that commutator, is the same as uh, taking the commutator with f of the commutator of ni with nj. And the abstract notion of curvature without worrying about certain niceties can be thought of as the commutator of the directional derivatives. So these derivatives don't commute with one another, and the extent to which they don't commute can be thought of as curvature. Now, of course, that actually is um, interpretable in terms of curvature and geometry as we know it, but I'm not going to talk about it that way. I'll just talk about it abstractly. So we have curvatures, um, and I have indicated on this slide how it comes about that if you, if you examine the iterated operation, then you will pick up those commutators. So, so then some aspects uh, that you're familiar with, uh, or you may be familiar with, of, of um, covariant derivatives happen just at this level of the abstraction. You could define f in the a direction derivative as delta sub a of f, noble sub a of f as the commutator with noble sub a, um, and, and you will find that the Jacobi identity then is telling you about the derivatives of the curvature. You see, here's the Jacobi identity for for N A and B and N C. Remember the Jacobi identity? It's iterated commutator, and then you cycle A B C, C B A, B C A, cycle round. 
and it's a it's a it's a uh, an identity about any commutators that this will be zero, where the algebra involved is associative, of course. Uh, and then you read it in my terms, and you have the curvature RAB derivative in the C direction, and the curvature RCA derivative in the B direction, and the curvature RBC derivative in the A direction. And that's one of the symmetries of curvature tensors. So you can um, have an interesting time playing with, uh, with the algebra of curvature tensors and things like that up here in this rarefied atmosphere of just non-commutative algebra and the definition of curvature that way. We can go on with this, but this is just uh, a taste of a certain direction that I won't do very much today. What I want to do is the simplest thing, and then we'll look at the Feynman-Dyson derivation. So what's the simplest thing? Um, the simplest thing would be to have some coordinates um, which commute with one another and, um, and to have uh, some uh, derivatives that commute with one another. So, uh, so I want to think of pi as representing the derivative in the xi direction. So you have to watch this. You could imagine that you walked into an advanced calculus course and the professor told you that he had decided that he would tell you about multivariable calculus, but he would tell you about it by representing all derivatives by commutators. Uh, and he would work with this formalism. And no physics was given except perhaps the concept of time to begin with. So then we have the derivative of f in the i direction, x i in the x direction i is the commutator with pi. The pi's commute with one another, which means that these derivative operators commute with one another. Um, but it, it's natural to suggest that um, that you would also have a derivative with respect to pi, and that we would call that commutator of xi with f, a dual thing. Uh, and that's just natural because we want it to be the case that xi pj is delta ij. There's the delta ij. Why? Because the derivative of xi with respect to xj should be p delta ij. So maybe you think p should be a momentum, but here it is just the dual. Uh, it is just what represents the derivative with respect to x. And then it's behaving a bit like momentum. Now, what I do not have here, I have space, but I don't have time. So I'm going to get time uh, by another operator with malice of forethought called h. And the derivative of something with respect to time is going to be the commutator of f with h. You know what we have to do for quantum mechanics, but we'll come back to that. So a, we might as well call H the Hamiltonian. Um, and remember, this is still just abstract formalism. And we're rep since we represent everything by a commutator, we have, and we wanted a, a, a nice commutative kind of flat world. So we've had the XIs commute with one another. We have the PIs represent uh, those derivatives. And we need another entity that represents time and its derivative. And then you can do a little computation. You can say, well, what is uh, the derivative with respect to time of pi? Well, it's the commutator with h, which is minus the commutator of h with pi. Oh, but the commutator of h with pi is the derivative of h with respect to xi by our definition. And what about the derivative of xi with respect to t? Well, that's the commutator of xi with h, but that is equal to the derivative of h with respect to pi by our definition. And those are Hamilton's equations. So Hamilton's equations are a tautology of setting up a flat, non-commutative world in the sense that all derivatives are represented by commutators. Flat, non-commutative world, and you get Hamilton's equations as part of the mathematical structure. Of course, Hamilton interpreted it originally 
in terms of the physics. You had a Hamiltonian, which is p squared over 2m plus uh, potential, um, and, um, and you represented Newton's law, which said that ma, md squared q dt squared, is the derivative of the potential. And, and then from that, you got Hamilton's equations. So, um, so you may always think of Hamilton's equations as coming from the quadratic potential of Hamilton uh, and, and being applied that way. And you wouldn't have uh, a clue that this was just a property of abstract calculus if you're thinking that way, except of course that it is what we did is related to Hamilton's line of thinking, uh, which was that Hamilton could deduce from what he did from his equations that the time derivative is given by the Poisson bracket of f with, the, with h. So in Hamilton's dynamics, the time derivative is given by the Poisson bracket, not by a commutator. And it wasn't until much later with Dirac that the uh, idea of uh, replacing Poisson brackets with commutators comes in. So you have this long and interesting history behind uh, the abstract formalism that I have just pulled out of a hat and and told you you could have taught first. And this uh, imaginary professor, this uh, maybe even not telling as professors of mathematics did in my day, not even telling uh, this class about the physical interpretation of what he wrote. Uh, but he should, right. Um, and then Poisson brackets don't quite obey the Leibniz rule except under an integrability condition, and those are Hamilton's equations. So there's all that in back of this, but remember what I said. This is just a, a very elementary abstract framework, which says that if I want my, all my derivatives to commute and I have a bunch of coordinates, and I write down the natural things and their duals and have a time operator. Then I get Hamilton's equations. There they are. And then you can go back and think about all the physics that underlies that again in a different way. Now, what about equations of motion? Well, then I would have that the xi's vary in time. And there would be some law a dynamical equation, gxi dt would be g sub i. Uh, and g sub i is some elements in the big non-commutative algebra. But I would like to refer them to flat coordinates somehow. The gi's, uh, thinking of the gi's as representing derivatives, they have, any element represents a derivative by taking a commutator with it. Well, uh, then I would like to think about how is that related to the nice derivatives in standard directions. So I will with, again, malice of forethought, write gi as pi minus ai for some ai that is given to me. And now look at what happens to the curvature. So we're, we're, what are we saying? We're saying that we have these standard derivatives which commute with one another. Uh, but then we have a bunch of elements whose, which we should think of as covariant derivatives. And, and they don't commute with one another, but let's look at them in relation to the elements that do commute with one another. Now, of course, you know that that's the formalism for thinking about electromagnetism or, K, or gauge. And indeed, it works right out. You see, the curvature Rij is the commutator of Gi with Gj which is pi minus ai and pj minus aj, and write it out. And what are you looking at? You're looking at the derivative of aj in the i direction, pi commutator aj, minus the derivative of ai in the j direction, plus the commutator of ai and aj. And there you are looking at the curvature of a gauge connection. And the ai becomes the gauge connection. So again, um, the imaginary mathematics professor tells his class about this as, uh, as his generalized uh, physical theory, um, and maybe doesn't uh, tell them about where it came from in the history of things, but he should. Um, but, it, uh, but in terms of the, of the elementary things that come out of taking this point of view, this is just one of the simple remarks that you can make right near the beginning, uh, the gauge 
curvature form. Uh, I, will, I can go on in that direction, and it's very interesting, but I want to show you what the Feynman-Dyson derivation looks like in this context. So we're going to become a bit more focused and nitty-gritty here, and that will be this derivation will be the remainder of the talk for now, anyway. So I'm going back to the Please, ideas. Can I, yes. Can I, can I come in there? Certainly. Um, and, and suggest that this is very, very beautiful. But you're an hour in already. Yeah. And, and you've got to stop in half an hour, in 20 minutes, in fact. That's right. Would this not perhaps be better being split into a second part of this very talk? Uh, I, th I, think you're, I think you're right. Let me, let me spend uh, uh, five or six minutes introducing what this looks like. Good. And then, we'll, uh, then we can discuss. Brilliant. Lovely. Because that way we come back to where I started. Over and out. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit more and stop. So what am I going to do for Feynman Dyson? Well, I'm in three space, right? Remember that imaginary math professor, he was in N space, right? As he should be, right? But we got to come back to three space here. So I have three uh position variables x but they are non-commuting x's like Feynman had and um and I'm going to define the b field to be x dot cross x and and now let's think about what that means right a cross b uh in the kth direction for a cross product has a formula epsilon i j k a i b j okay where epsilon i j k is one if i j k is a permutation of three things with sign one minus one if it's a permutation of sine minus one and zero if any two of them are equal that's the definition of the cross product and you just generalize it to a non-commutative cross product by saying i will understand that the a's don't necessarily commute with the b's and the index index things don't necessarily commute with themselves even if you have different indices okay so that's b but now i define e to be the time derivative of x dot. So in Feynman derivation, x dot didn't have a definition, uh, the e did not have a definition. Now it has a definition. And on the other hand, we take the ith derivative of f to be a covariant derivative. It's the xi dot xi dot commutated with f, not some abstract pi. And these xi dots don't necessarily commute with one another, exactly the way Feynman would have it, OK? And also exactly the way Feynman would have it, I define the partial with respect to t of f as f dot minus the sum over i of xi dot di of f. Now that's the advanced calculus formula for the partial derivative of something. You have the f dot, and then you have the partial derivative with respect to time in terms of the time variations of its variables, the standard calculus formula. But nobody said that there was any such formula in the non-commutative world. This is a definition. This definition binds the f dot with the notion of time variation. It's a definition. And it is the constraint which makes everything else work. I'm not assuming any other commutator equations. I'm actually doing a generalization of Maxwell's theory to gauge theory in this formalism. That's all I have is just this constraint. And then what we will get is the following. We will we will prove that x double dot is e plus x dot cross b. We will prove that del dot b is zero, and we will prove the Maxwell equations as well with an appropriate current thing, d squared dt squared minus del squared. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to prove this. And, and then, um, since I'm going to talk about this the next time, you give me time to think about um, what it really is saying about gauge theory, but this really is a gauge theoretic formulation, which happens to look like electromagnetism. If you 
if you specialized it in a certain way, we would be talking about exactly the sort of electromagnetism that Feynman and Dyson had in mind. And the further comment is what drives this derivation? What's in back of it? The, what drives this derivation is the epsilon, the structure of the SO3 Lie algebra, if you like, the epsilon. The epsilon has the property that if you tie two epsilons together, they resolve into Kronecker deltas, according to this diagrammatic formula. Everything is actually a consequence of that and the definitions that we've made. So standing uh, the needle on its head, uh, you can think of this derivation as a, as a, as a theorem about epsilon. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll show you what I mean, but I'm not going to do it now. We'll talk about it the next time when it happens. Um, never mind this. This is just explaining about the epsilon. But it means that the derivations here are going to look like this. They're going to look like um, diagrammatics, which uh, involves the uh, equations about the epsilon in order to make it work. And so I track the epsilon and how it behaves by thinking of the vectors as uh, as um, abstract tensors with little lines associated with them that correspond to the tensor index. That's the method. And using that method and the framework that we've been talking about, we get this way of thinking about gauge. So I'll stop there.